Hi, everybody. For this episode, we're joined by Andrew Hopkins from Minnesota here in the United States. He is the Bright Futures and Best Buy Teen Tech Center Director for the Plymouth Christian Youth Center. Andrew credits all the people that have poured effort into him, and he enjoys doing the same for others. Andrew, the people who know you best call you by your nickname. So is it okay if I call you D-Hop through our conversation? Absolutely. That's that's fine. Cool. Well, Diop, thanks for being a guest on the show. No, thank you guys for having me. I totally appreciate the opportunity to get to share my story. You grew up in a large family in Detroit. What was it like to be one of 10 kids in a family? <laughs> uh, I mean, for me, it was great. Uh, uh, my older brothers were so deep off into sports and so i kind of followed in their footsteps and things like that uh i i have one sister out of out of that family and uh she continues to run everybody even to this <laughs> day <laughs> so it was really really super cool actually growing up with uh so many siblings it was actually really really cool for me and what did you like most about it was it just all the relationships different kinds of relationships you had with all your your brothers and your one sister or was it that it just taught you to kind of fend for yourself and speak up and you know be heard in the midst of all these kids a combination of all of that you know you definitely had to speak up uh, you definitely had to understand how to maneuver in different personalities and different type of uh, uh, ways. And it, it got me to understand that people are different, even though you're from the same space. Uh, so that was very interesting. You know, you had the quiet brother, you had the loud brother, you had the, you had the bookworm brother, you had the I'm in the streets brothers, you had the this, the that. So it was like a whole sort of uh, village within itself, right? So it was actually really super cool, yeah. Cool. So which brother were you? Were you the one in the, in the gym all the time? Or what, what, what was – how did your other siblings describe you as that brother? Uh, I was the one that they would describe as kind of uh, real, real level-headed. Uh, I kind of thought things through quite a bit. Uh, I was able to learn from uh, other brothers' mistakes and different things like that. Uh, so I got to kind of uh, take a little bit of in from all of the different angles, right? Uh, you know, everything from the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, I remember teachers. I, I used to get frustrated with teachers because we all went to the same uh, elementary school in the same middle school or junior high, as it was called back then. I don't know if I'm aging myself at all, uh, but uh, in high schools, and I used to hate when teachers would be, well, you're like your brother so-and-so, or you're like your brother this, or you're like your brother that. that I, I didn't really like that a lot because I felt I was my own person, right? But you know, being family, there is a certain connectedness that we do have. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, your your mom and dad are like superstars to raise that many kids. What were your mom and dad like? Uh, uh, for us, uh, we were very fortunate. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of uh, uh, African Americans family now they don't have both parents uh, in the household full time. And we were lucky in a sense that we had that. Uh, my dad was a hard worker, uh, worked at Chrysler, retired out of Chrysler like a lot of men in Detroit. The saying is, is uh, you either work for the plant or you work for a company that makes something for the yeah, plant, yeah. right? And so, so we were part of all of that. My mom, uh, fortunately, uh, was a, able to be a stay-home mom which was really super cool for us because it always gave us uh, someone who we can uh, come to with any issues, any problems. Uh, I grew up in a neighborhood where uh, anything that you did, it somehow got home before you got home. So uh, those type of things like that. Uh, so it was really, really cool. You know, again, my mom, uh, God bless her soul, and my dad, uh, you know, they raised us to the best of their ability. 
Uh, they raised us to be strong, competent, and uh, for us to be caring people. So, you know, it, it actually rubbed off on us, and here we are today. Yeah, I got that. Um, and, you know, you, you do come across as a really strong, confident, critical thinker, level-headed, uh, but also yeah. a very compassionate and uh, caring person. And I got that right away Absolutely. when we were getting to know each other. That came through loud and clear how you really do have feelings and emotions and, and are in touch with those. Uh -huh. Where did that side of you come from? More from your mom or your dad? Who was the, uh, the, the person that was the empathetic person in the, in the duo? Uh, I, I would say my mom, you know, she, she carried that uh, very well. You know, my mom was one of the people, whoever she could help in the neighborhood, uh, whatever, issues or community things that was going on. My mom always kind of stuck out and led in those different areas. Uh, she always was thinking about somebody else. She always was concerned about, you know, other families, other kids. So it wasn't just about her kids, whatever thing she tried to engage herself and involve herself in. It was always kind of with this concept and thinking of how can it actually help everybody versus just the particular, you know, her particular family or not. So I would say that come from my mom for sure. Yeah. And was your dad more the disciplinarian then, or did, did you not have like that <laughs> division of roles? Cause I'm wondering 10 kids. Um, I'm sure, now, I'm sure you tested the limits a little bit. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, we're traditional in a sense of like the, the, the mom dealt with all that, you know, uh, there was always the threat of, I'm going to tell your okay, dad, got it. but, okay. but the actual discipline was handed down, uh, by my mom. Uh, and I mean, you know, we, we got whoopings and things like that. I know nowadays people think of that as, oh, that's abusive and different things like that. Uh, I actually grew up with the concept that, you know, uh, sometimes discipline was needed, you know, and, uh, I, I think that's what definitely kept us on the right track. Uh, nowadays, kids are kind of left to their own devices. Uh, you know, you can't you can't spank them. Or I'm not saying child abuse. Don't get it twisted or what I'm mm -hmm. saying. But uh, 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 discipline uh, has been taken out of the family structure, and I think that that is a problem. And I think that that's. Uh, uh, some of the reasons why a lot of our kids just kind of are way off, off, off track in where they should be. Yeah, young people need parameters, right? <laughs> Whether it's discipline, uh, removal yeah. of privileges, or whatever. Uh, young people need yeah. bumpers in, in their world to know right. when they're kind of going off track and not going down the right yeah. lane anymore. And that's how your parents yeah. chose to do that. And for you and for your family, uh, it seemed to work out pretty well. You you stayed out of trouble for absolutely. the most part, right? Oh, yeah, for the most part. I mean, uh, I grew up in an urban environment, you know, Detroit. A lot of different things coming at you fast and furious. And so, you know, fortunately for me, you know, I was able to kind of stay off of those yeah. things. Uh, you know, definitely didn't end up in prison time or anything like that. Uh, uh, fortunately for me, a couple of incidents in my life early clearly deterred me away from from that. You know, some things my brothers went through, uh, made a couple of bad decisions with some friends, and I kind of was like, eh, I don't know about that. That, that ain't going to be the kind of life that I want to live, so. You know, so I was relatively uh, uh, lucky in that. And again, like I say, uh, getting disciplined when you did do wrong, that kind of helped, uh, uh, that, that kind of helped to ingrain that concept of you don't want to go down these roads. You know, you want to kind of stay a little bit over here to the right. So Yeah, I hear you. And I know when we were getting to know each other, you talked about critical thinking as something you do to try to help young people. But you also talked about you as being a critical thinker, and that helped you in so many of those situations where the opportunity was there, but you made the right decisions right. Uh, for a whole variety of reasons. So how do you think that you being a critical thinker 
has helped you uh, in in the world so far? What what has it done for you? Well, what it's done for me is it allowed me to take information in. Uh, it allowed me to sit back, make decisions based on how that's going to impact me and or others for that matter. So uh, I definitely deal from a space of you just ain't talking me into no BS, right? Mm-hmm. That that just ain't going to happen, you know, because uh, I, I will go, I will research stuff, I will look up meaning, I will look at how that lands in my particular life and how that might affect others. Uh, I mean, I have buddies who would come up with all of these get rich quick, quick schemes or, Hey man, let's go and slang this or let's go and do that. And I would sit back and I'd think for a minute and I'd be like, okay, so we're going to go do something at a store that we go at every day where everybody knows us and they know our voices and they know our names, but we're going to go and do this. I don't think so. So (laughs) that's not going to end well. And what reinforced that critical thinking concepts for me was I have friends who did go and do those things and ultimately their their lives end up in and out of jail and different Mm. things like that. So it was reinforced to me that my process was the right thing to be doing. So that really helped me. Well, I give you a lot of credit for that. You know, you've said a number of times, like, I'm, I'm grateful, I'm lucky. Uh, you use those mm-hmm. kind of terms. But in fact, I believe that you are pretty much responsible for a lot of those decisions you made and you've been able to stay away from that. And the peer pressure is so great uh, during adolescence oh, to, yeah, to engage in that kind of stuff. Especially young black uh, young people in in urban areas, Absolutely. The, the, this pressure is just so enormous to go down that road and do yeah. that kind of stuff. How did you hang out with people and be friends with them and still say, "Yeah, I'm not going to do that"? How, what about you uh, that was able to navigate all that? Uh, how did you do that? Well, again, you know, when you grow up in these different communities, uh, there's all sorts of people, right? And when we were talking about learning at home how to deal with different personalities, yeah. how to understand that, all of that stuff just transpired. It rolled over into my real life outside of my house. Uh, I knew every gang banger. I knew every dope dealer. I knew every jack boy. I knew every one of them. But I also knew the basketball players. I also knew the straight A students. I also knew the creative people. I also, So I was able to kind of interact inside of all of these circles, right? Uh, guys who were kind of, you know, on the far end of the spectrum, they respected the fact that, hey, dude is cool, but he just ain't on what we on. And so I was always able to kind of interact and engage with that. Plus, my go-to always was, don't make me call my brother. (laughs) So, (laughs) you know, everybody knew my family. And so it was like, nah, we ain't even trying to do him like that. You know, (laughs) he he got a squad of his own that he could bring. Nine of them, man. We're going to line up. Right, right, uh, right. Eight, I guess. Yeah, eight, nine. And then I also... Uh, my dad, all of his brothers, all of them came up from Mississippi uh, during the Great Migration, and uh, all of them had 13, 14, 15 kids. So the Hopkins name, you know, uh, we were known all over the city just because there were so many of us yeah. on top of it. So, yeah. And were, I didn't ask you this at the beginning, but are you the youngest of all those boys? No, no, no. So the way that it all rolled out is we have my younger brother, who's the baby boy, who's the baby of it all. And then my sister, then okay. me, and then on up the ladder. Yeah, Got it. Well, I just wonder if, mm-hmm. you know, we were talking all those dynamics just within your household, all the things that you had to learn to navigate and find your unique self within all those roles, it seemed like that spilled out into the streets. You were able to take those skills and use what you learned from all your different siblings and incorporate them into survival 
And also, I mean, it's a thrive. I mean, here you are, the director of these programs. You've been, I, I read your resume. You've done a lot of really great things. And so you 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 came out of that whole environment just thriving. And uh, it's really cool that you've decided to take those skills and give it back to other people. Oh, yeah. I mean, that is what was pouring into me. So uh, me doing the work that I'm doing is, uh, real natural for me, you know, it's real natural, it's authentic, it's it, it, it it's what I want to do, I, it wasn't like I was forced into it, uh, and like I said, you know, just the things that people poured into me, I was just, you know, it was just a natural thing that this is what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, I've had other type of jobs and different type of pursuits in my life and different things like that. But it always did come back to uh, how can I uh, be of service to others? And it's not like what I'm doing is making a difference. It's really the concepts of people, uh, young people investing in their own successes, right? You know, that's something that I talk to uh, about folks all the time. Uh, too many times programs think that they're the reason that somebody is doing something and then to me, that's 100% not, not in my case, that's not the case. We just create an environment and a space for people to be able to find themselves and for people to uh, get their answers and invest in, it, in themselves. That's what it's really about for me. I agree. And I'm so glad that you have decided to pursue this profession because I bet you you are building true, authentic relationships with young people that need somebody like you in their world to help guide them and, and to develop those critical thinking skills that you so masterfully uh, have uh, understood. We do need to take a short break, but when we come back, I'd like to talk okay. to you a little bit more about some of the things you've learned in your youth work and, and some of the things that inspire you. So we'll be right back after this short break. And we're back with D hop who works in Minneapolis at the Plymouth Christian youth center. Dehop, thanks for uh, all your background that you provided us before the break about your family and all those dynamics and how you navigated some touchy situations. But let's talk about youth work. What have you learned okay. uh, from being in a youth work field? What have you learned about yourself? Uh, for me, uh, again, uh, it's, it's a real natural space for me. It's not like a forced space. Uh, like I'm trying to interject myself into something. Uh, again, the things that was poured into me, you know, I, I, I just attempt to do that. Uh, you've heard me use the term authentic. Uh, uh, young people really, really can smell out BS very quickly. Yes. Right? Yes. Uh, and a lot of times the reason our kids don't engage and don't necessarily uh, take advantage of some things that is placed in front of them, because it's not coming from a, a true authentic space. Uh, somebody is interested because we need numbers for youth. We need to show where we came into the community and try this, or we need to do that. Uh, so I tend to try to be as authentic as I can with young people. They seem to gravitate toward that. Uh, I also, in being authentic, it allows me to meet young people where they're at versus me thinking, well, you should be here or you should be there or anything like that. So a lot of my engagement, again, is from a concept of coaching versus teaching. Mm -hmm. Uh, you may have heard me say earlier I, uh, things I didn't like about my teachers because I kind of felt they were always trying to put their perspective on you, whereas coaching is this different concept of, okay, let's figure out what your strengths are and how do we really explore that, right? You know, if, you, if you're a point guard, how do we give you the skills to really be the best at that? If you're a shooter, how do we give you the skills? and the techniques to be better at that. Whereas teachers tend to try to, here's what I think and here's the answer, and that's what it is. So a lot of my engagement uh, definitely rolls around sort of coaching philosophies versus a teaching philosophy. 
I could I could see that and that authentic self. Um, I think about all the young people today who are growing up with these systems that are designed to uh, oppress, systems that are set up for young people to fail. And here you yeah. are, D Hop, in the middle of all this, and young people see you talking like you talk in terms of finding your strengths, pursuing what you're good at, using some rational thought to make some decisions that what how's that going to impact you? Do you find young people just gravitate towards you? And I, I don't I don't mean that, you know, like it's hard to be humble, but you must just be something right. that these young kids just look at and go, God, man, T hop, man, he he gets it, you know? Well, fortunately they do. Uh, and I'm truly humbled by that, actually, you know, because uh, there's so much for kids to access now, you know, through technology, through their cell phone, through a computer, through the million and one channels on television now. I mean, there's so many different things. And so, again, where, where I try to land that with them is I've been there, done that. But I also can learn from you. Uh, I, I actually learn more from young people than probably I actually give them. Uh, being connected to them, I'm constantly learning new things. I'm constantly learning uh, new ways that they think. And then I'm always trying to figure out how do I kind of, how do I connect that to the things that I and values that I share? And so it seems to be a pretty good combination of that. Uh, the young people I have been engaging with, uh, we've seen kids who's went on to college, who's graduated, who has degrees now, uh, kids who have went on and have opened up businesses and different things like that, uh, kids who are doing similar work to what I'm doing now. So just over the years, it's this constant thing of seeing these young people evolve. Uh, and it's always really good to see that you know, they did take in some of the things that you said. I mean, clearly there's some kids who didn't and, you know, there might be some struggles and different things that they're going through. Uh, but overall, kids do tend to gravitate toward uh, what I'm talking about and what I'm kind of presenting and putting out there for them, uh, opportunities for them to engage in. Uh, so, and then when you mentioned like, racism is, you know, I talk to young people about systematic racism quite a bit, uh, getting them to understand that it's an entire system that is set up, you know, from banking. So banks won't lend you money to buy a house. So you can't live in this community, which then means that you pay more money for gas in this community. Therefore you can't do that. Or, uh, just high, all of these things are connected to each other. That's why it's called systematic yeah. racism versus uh, individualized or specific racism. <laughs> uh, and so getting them to understand why it's so many roadblocks that they will run up against. And that's part of the battle uh, with young people. If they don't really understand all of the different obstacles and the different things that's involved, they might focus on one thing and then they'll never get to where they're trying to get to, you know? So we talk quite a bit about that. I'm so grateful that you're in their world and in their space to help them navigate. Uh, clearly those systems need to be broken down and destroyed and absolutely dismantled absolutely. and rebuilt with an equity lens uh, without, without question. But I'm glad you're there for them now and helping them. You said something before that was so cool when you talk about you learn more from them than you'll be able to teach them. Um, are, are you just a lifelong learner or how do you like, how do you be so humble or, you know, vulnerable to say stuff like that? Because I think there's a human tendency for especially adults to want to be, I've got the answers here. I'm going to tell you what you should do. <laughs> But you don't come at it with that approach at all. Where does that sense of humility yeah. and, and inquiry come from? Well, for me, I think of like engaging with young people kind of like you have a, a you have like different models, right? You know, I tend to function from more of an empowerment model versus uh, a model of 
here's where I know what's best for you. Uh, uh, here's where I'm going to take you and do this. Here's where I'm going to show you how to get this job yeah. or how to do this. The problem with that sort of a model is when that person goes away, those people, they didn't learn anything. That's right. Therefore, now they're back to where they were at, you know. So all of those kind of social services type models, that's why, in my humble opinion, why they're not as effective is because once you remove that person or or that system that was doing everything for somebody, then they – and then a lot of times the collapse is even more worse right? Because you didn't learn anything and you sort of reverting back to what you were doing. Whereas when I talk about uh, uh, investing in your own success uh, to where you are taking the lead on that, you're taking that. All I'm doing is sort of, hey, here's some resources. Here's some things you may want to think about as you're trying to pursue this. But the onyx is put on you to be able to uh, uh, get yourself to where you want to get to. So when I'm out of the picture, you have those tools, you have those things because you were the one who were doing it and was facilitating it all along. All I, you know, all we're doing is being a conduit and creating a space and an environment. So I think it's important that young people kind of realistically understand that, you know, you, you have to want to do this. You know, I tell people, I can't want it more than you want it. <laughs> you have to want it more than me. So that that's sort of how I kind of think about empowerment concepts, uh, dealing in things not from a deficit. Uh, too many times our kids are engaging with people and programs and spaces where they come in and they're already looking at you as a deficit. And so if I'm looking at you as a deficit, my expectation is going to be lower for you because I already feel you can't do nothing, right? So uh, I don't go into it like that. I go into it thinking that people are powerful, that young people are powerful, they're strong. Uh, they just need a little swerve in the direction. That's all. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. What do you like most about being a youth worker, Dehop? What do you get out of it? Uh, for me, uh, truthfully, what I get out of it is when I get that call from a parent who said, man, my kid is doing more of this now from after kind of kicking around with you. Or when I get a call from a kid saying, hey, d I got accepted into Howard University. Uh, thank you. Uh, hey, man, uh, the things that you guys helped me with. Uh, man, I actually got that scholarship that we went after, you know. Things like that is what's really cool for me. Uh, I'll, I'll never forget, like, little kids when they'll say to me, oh, man, you know, uh, after doing the literacy program, man, I'll be reading to my little brother, dude. You know, I'll be like, oh, cool, awesome. you know. So I don't look for the – I mean, it's great when you get funding and stuff like that because – that sort of lends itself to saying that you're doing something that's cool or good or whatever. But I'm more of an anecdotal person and more like direct contact. So it's things like that that that, that make me keep saying, oh, cool, we, we good. You know, we going to keep plugging, we going to keep plugging, you know. So that's what I really like when young people say things or I hear from their parent. Uh, or if I hear from a family member, man, dude, attitude is different now. You know, he ain't even hanging with that no more, or he's doing this now. You know, that's lets me know, and that's what keeps me motivated. Thank you for choosing to pour your heart and soul into this work and doing whatever you can to help young people find their way in this world. Everybody, every yeah. young person has a, has a gift to give back to our community. It's a matter Absolutely. of just figuring it out what that is and helping them pursue that and supporting them in their desire yeah. to achieve what it is that they would like to achieve in life. So I'm so grateful for your work. Thank you for doing that. No, no. Uh, it's, actually, I'm, more appreciative of being given the opportunity to do this type of work, to be frank and honest. Uh, 
uh, again, like I say, it's a natural space for me. Uh, I probably a uh, very few people in the world and in life get to actually do something they enjoy every day. Uh, so I, I really am, am grateful for that opportunity. I share that with you, D-Hop. And, and I know other people who are really good at this have that exact same feeling. Thank you for pointing that out. Our regular listeners know at the end of the show, I always ask our guest what words of wisdom or inspiration they would like to leave with our listeners. So D-Hop, what would you like to share with our listeners as we close out your show? Well, a uh, couple of things. I mean, you know, if you're in this line of work, I would, I would like to ask you to try to connect with young people in a more authentic way. Try to, you know, realistically meet them where they're at. Uh, create expectations for our young people. Don't just keep giving them all this low-hanging fruit. Uh, it's, it's not going to help them in the long run. As a matter of fact, it's probably going to hurt them in the long run. Uh, and then for youth in general, you know, connect out with people who's really trying to help you get to where you're trying to get to. Again, you have to invest in your own success. You know, a program isn't some magic bullet. A program is not going to have every answer for you. So you have to really, really, really uh, uh, invest in yourself. You know, there's a lot of resources out there. There's a lot of people who really do care about you out there, uh, uh, contrary to a lot of things that you might hear or believe. Uh, and just try to realistically connect with folks who's trying to do things. You know, stay positive uh, in spite of some of the massive negativity that's going on around us, but try to try to find your authentic space 